Well, hey, Grace Church, glad that uh, you are here today. You showed up on time. I told worship, light, worship night last night that the clock in my car is finally correct. <laughs> so happy for that. <clears throat> uh, I want to direct your attention before we get into First Peter. First of all, thanks, James, yesterday or last week for uh, bailing me out. Uh, he did a great job introducing us to First Peter. But before we get into that, you have these cards in your seat back. I want to draw your attention. This is the way that we, you and me can talk. You know, this is the way that uh, I can know from you what I can do for you, what we as a church can, how we can respond to you. If you have a prayer concern, if you are new, uh, if you have a, a step to take, uh, let us know on those cards and we would be glad to respond to you uh, in that way. So uh, a lot to cover this morning. Let's get right into it. First Peter, his original audience in the first century, uh, believers uh, living in a very hostile environment, uh, written in about the 60s in the first century. They were aliens in a pagan culture. He's writing to a church uh, ruled by the Roman Empire. Nero is on the throne. Nero was uh, an insane person. He blamed the Christians for the burning of Rome, which he instigated, uh, which resulted in the persecution of many believers. And so they were the target of slander and discrimination, just not because of their faith, but because they... Uh, of who they were. They were mistreated on all kinds of sides. They were innocent in all those accusations. 2,000 years later, we as a church are living in a progressively intolerant age when it comes to all things Christian. Don't know if you've noticed. But you can see this in the education system. You can see this in the social issues of our day. You can see this in the marketplace. You can see this on social media, in the political discussions that we're having. Uh, I could list example after example. We could spend all morning talking about like, uh, the, like the baker in Colorado or the florist in Washington State whose businesses were just shut down and closed because they were Christian because they wanted to live out their faith convictions in their business. Like the third grader in Missouri, a third grader who was mandated by her school to wear a mask, but when got to school had to remove her mask because everybody else in her class got to pick the mask they wanted to wear, but her mask said, Jesus loves you on it. And so was forced to remove her mask. Friends, this is happening in this country. Chris Hodges uh, is a pastor of Church of the Highlands, uh, which is a very large church in Birmingham, Alabama. I've known of Chris because of the work that they've been doing in that city for a long time. In 2002, during the height of the pandemic, he clicked, he, get this, he clicked. He just clicked, which should tell you something. Don't ever click. He clicked a like button to a social media post and one high school teacher took offense at the click and took it to the media outlets of that community. And as a result, the Birmingham Housing Authority canceled all of their rental agreements with the church that subsequently closed down many of their campuses because they were using those rented facilities and cut ties with the public health center that the church with their own funds and resources created to serve the under-resourced areas of their community. Get this, friends, the opinion of one high school teacher who took their offense to the media overrid one pastor's click on a media post, a church that was providing free health care to the community of Birmingham, to the public housing residents in that city. It was more important to be politically correct than to be socially compassionate. This is the world in which we live. We could go on. Christian adoption agencies, Catholic charities, bar, they are now prohibited from placing children in much needed homes simply because of their biblical worldview on marriage and gender issues. They're denying children homes because we don't believe, we don't agree with the political mainstream. Friends, this is serious. I don't want to be alarmist, but... I just want to say, friends, there are too many of us self-identified Christians who are either not aware of the trends in our culture or don't consider those trends to be all that serious. And friends, it is serious. There are too many of us who just kind of want to blend into the culture, not make waves. And, and friends, studies have shown us, surveys have so, showed us that self, many self-identified Christians, uh, they don't differ 
in, in, the, in the cultural trends when it comes to sexuality and human dignity and the sanctity of life. There's the, they're not that, that different from the mainstream culture. And then there are others of us who just kind of want to hide away in fear, hoping that all of this will blow over and it'll be better at another day. But Peter is telling us in this letter, neither of these approaches will work because you have been called by Jesus to be salt and light in a very dark and disintegrating culture. And friends, this is the culture in which we live. You have a faith. If it is a faith, it will be tested by fire. So now is not the time to fear, and it is certainly not the time to fit in. It is time to be salt and light. That's what Peter is saying to the church in the first century. 2,000 years later, our identity has not changed. He begins chapter 1, verse 1, elect exiles. This is who you are. You belong to God. You do not belong here. This is not your home. Friends, we, the American church, have been blessed by a culture heavily influenced for for the past two centuries in a biblical worldview. And that is disintegrating before our eyes. But what Peter, who Peter is writing to in the first century, had no such benefit. They were completely out of place in the world. They were believers in Jesus being slandered and reviled. And then 2,000 years later, we're still being accused. Accused of being intolerant, accused of being oppressive, accused of being homophobic or anti-science or anti-women or on and on and on and on. If you want to follow Jesus, Peter says in the first century, you will suffer, so suffer well. 2,000 years later, he's saying, if you want to follow Jesus, you will suffer, so suffer well. Why? Because you have a hope that is imperishable. You have a hope that is unfading. You have a hope that is kept in heaven for you. In heaven, this is not your home. You don't belong here. But while you're here, hope, hope, get your hope up. Chapter one, verse three, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. First Peter is all about hope, 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 hope. Everybody say hope, hope, hope. The firm conviction, what is hope? It is a firm conviction. It is not wishful thinking. It is a firm conviction of a promised future. We know what is coming. We are secured by that, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You belong to God. You do not belong here. So be hopeful. There is every reason to be filled with hope. There is no reason to be cynical or, or pessimistic. There is no reason to cower in fear. There is, no, there is no purpose in trying to blend in and compromise your faith. There is no reason uh, to be overcome by fear because your faith has overcome the world. So be hopeful. Be hoped filled. Now, this is where we left off last week. This is what Peter laid out in this letter. Three major themes that will recur, will repeat itself throughout this letter. The first one was embrace your hope. Embrace your hope. You've been redeemed. You've been repurposed. God has you here in this place, at this time, in this moment of history for a reason. Why? Because you have family members, you have friends, you have coworkers, you have neighbors, you have people you engage with in the community who are looking for hope. And later on in this letter, Peter will tell us, be ready to give the reason for your hope. Be ready because people will ask you the reason. Why, why do you think that? Why do you believe that? Why do you li- Nobody thinks that. Nobody lives like that. So why do you do that? Be ready, embrace your hope, and be ready to share your hope. That's the first thing. The second one is to suffer well. Your faith will be tested by your culture. And friends, this is not unusual. This is not out of place. You serve a Jesus who died on the cross. You follow a suffering servant. So embrace your sufferings and entrust your sufferings to the one who suffered for you. Peter in this passage calls it various trials. It almost seems like he minimizes it, but he's just simply telling us there is, there is no end to the ways that you will suffer. <laughs> you will suffer on many sides. In the first century, uh, their suffering included being thrown to the lions and burned at the stake. So what are you complaining about? Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> 21st century church, you might lose your business. You might lose your job. You might be ostracized from the community. Friends, the testing of your faith proves that your faith is real. And when that faith is tested, it will strengthen your character and burn away all those false hopes that we tend to put our our hopes in that distract and divide our hearts. So Peter is telling us, do not let the testing of your faith go unrewarded. Stand firm, be faithful, be hope filled. And how do you do that? Here's the third theme, fix your eyes on Jesus. Don't take your eyes off Jesus. Don't be discouraged or distracted or divided. 
This is not your home, so don't get comfortable here. Keep looking to Jesus until he brings you home. Be hopeful. Get your hope up. So again, this is where Peter left us, and this is where we begin today. In verse 13 of chapter 1, would you stand with me? It's a rather lengthy passage. I want to read all of it, and then we'll dig into it. Verse 13, therefore, prepare your minds for action and be sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy." And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each man's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world but was made manifest in the the last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. The word of the Lord remains forever. Bring that back on on the screen, if you would. The word of the Lord remains forever. Would you say that with me? The word of the Lord remains forever. Friends, everything else in this world will fade, will die, disintegrate, but the word of the Lord remains forever forever. Say that again. The word of the Lord remains forever. And this word, the word of the Lord, the good word, the good news, this is what was preached. This is what we have received from God. Thank you. You may be seated. There is a way. There is a way that you and I are meant to live as Jesus followers. There are distinguishing markers, marks, of a Jesus follower. And in this section, Jesus is calling us to that act. He's, this is a call to action in this passage, so to speak. You have an inheritance in Jesus, a living hope kept in heaven for you, a future that will, that will outweigh the present suffering, whatever you go through in this life. You have a faith that is grounded in a living hope. And now you're called to action because of that. You might be familiar with the words of James in his letter, who said to us, faith without works is dead. Remember that phrase? Faith without works is dead. It is possible to have a dead faith, a faith that is not live, a faith that is not Uh, valid or uh, 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 strong or or truthful. You can also have a dead hope. You can have a dead hope. Paul is, excuse me, Peter isn't talking about wishful thinking or, or blind optimism. Don't worry, be happy. That's not what this is about. This is about a firm conviction rooted in the evidence of Jesus's resurrection. We know for sure of what we hope for, what we look forward to. Why? Because of what has happened in the past, the historical resurrection of Jesus Christ, the foundation, the cornerstone of our faith, the foundation of our hope. Friends, this is how, this is how it works. Everything hinges on Jesus coming back from the dead. Everything, everything. Peter, uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, if Jesus didn't come back from the dead, we're all wasting our time. Let's all go home. Okay, so it all hinges on the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus could predict his own death and resurrection, which he did, and then if he could pull that off, which he did, then everything Jesus ever told us or taught us, everything that Jesus ever predicted for the future or promised us in the future, friends, it can be trusted. It can be trusted. Why do do I believe the Bible? Friends, I don't believe the Bible because Jesus told me to which he did, but I believe the Bible because Jesus rose from the dead. And because Jesus rose from the dead, and now he's telling me to trust the Bible, everything that God said in the Bible, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to trust the Bible. I'm going to read the Bible and I'm going to do what it says. 
Not because Jesus said it, but because he rose from the dead and then he said it. (laughs) Friends, everything else works like this. If Jesus rose from the dead, then everything he says about my life, what to do with my money, what to do with my sexuality, what to do with my relationships, what to do with my job, everything. If Jesus came back from the dead, then it affects everything that I do. I have a hope. I have a firm conviction that if Jesus could come back from the dead, then I, I kind of believe that he'll, he's going to come back again. I kind of believe that. <laughs> I'm kind of looking forward to that. Because right now, Paul, Peter is writing to a church in trouble. And he's saying, get your hope up. There's no reason not to have hope because of the resurrection of Jesus. You have been born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What Peter said 2,100 years ago to the first century church, friends, could not be more relevant to the 21st century church in which you and I operate. Don't let your suffering go unrewarded. Get your hope up. So the question for us this morning is, what does that hope look like? In this cultural moment where genuine followers of Jesus are feeling the heat and feeling more and more like aliens and strangers, four things. Here's the first one. We have an alert mind. We have a mind that Paul says, prepare your minds for action, an active mind, a sober mind, a mind that is set a mind that is set or focused or serious, to to be serious-minded about what's what's going on. Not a worried mind, not not a fearful mind, not a joyless mind. Friends, hope gives us a confidence to live with a great deal of joy, regardless of circumstance. Hope gives us peace in the storm, in the conflict. Not a mind that is obsessed. Friends, there's no reason to obsess about what's going on in this world. There's a lot going on in this world, right? We know what's going on. You know what's going on in this world? The world is falling apart (laughs) on every side. The world is just disintegrating. Everybody knows it. Everybody sees it. Not everybody knows why or what to do about it. COVID wars, world wars, gender wars, political wars, racial wars. The world is a mess. It's always been a mess. It's getting messier by the moment. Here's the deal, friends. Believers, believers believe in history. Believers believe in his story. Believers believe that God is writing a story and he is faithful to to finish that story. We believe the time is linear, that we're headed somewhere, that the church, we believe that God is in control of where this whole thing is headed, right? We believe that, right? We believe that. And why do I say that? Because this world has no such hope. Uh, we, We are on the cusp of March Madness, the greatest sporting event in the history of sports. If you disagree with me, I love you, but you're wrong. (laughs) Actually, this applies to any sport. If you've ever watched a recorded game where where you already know the score, uh, it changes the way you watch the game, right? Uh, When you know your team has already won the game, you don't lose your marbles when things look bleak. Peter says, hope, get your hope up. We know there's a game, and this is war. Friends, the world doesn't know that. The world without God knows no such thing. You got got to understand, you got to think about this, friends. If, If all we are is a bunch of chemicals trying to survive, then so what? What's the point? Countries want to take over countries? Who cares? What's the point? Governments want to control your every move? So what? What's the point? But friends, we as believers know there's a point. We know there's a story. We know we're headed somewhere. And we know how this story ends. We know who wins the game. So all the more reason, friends, this is the point. All the more reason to stay alert, to be sober-minded, to pay attention to what's going on. Why? Because what happens in this world matters. And it matters because people are being affected by what happens in this world. We are engaged in an earthly battle of spiritual origins, fighting for the souls of mankind. So it matters to the people around us. So set your mind. You have the hope. They don't have the hope. So discipline your thinking. Pay attention. Be aware of the opportunities where you can, where you can influence and be salt and light in this culture that's just simply falling apart. So that when the, your enemy tempts you to doubt the promise and the goodness of God, that the resurrection of Jesus can comfort your hearts and assure your minds. You have a hope, a living hope evidenced by an alert mind. Here's the second mark, an obedient will. 
an obedient will. Peter says, do not be conformed. And then later he says, be holy for I am holy. I love the message paraphrase of this verse that says, as obedient children, let yourselves be pulled into a way of life, pulled in into a way of life shaped by God's life, a life energetic and blazing with holiness. Holiness, holiness. Most of us have a problem with holiness, probably because we don't understand holiness, what it means to be holy like God is holy. And our misunderstanding of holiness makes, it re- makes us reluctant to even pursue holiness or know what holiness is supposed to look like. Let's talk about this word holy. There are two aspects to understanding what it means to be holy. To be holy is to be distinct or different. Uh, In the biblical vernacular, it is to be set apart, set apart or separated from everything else. If you were to create two columns of reality for all of reality, you would put God in one column and you would put everything else in the other column, because everything else is created. God is not created. He is only holy other. Uh, Isaiah 46 says, I am God and there's no, there is no other. There is no one like me. I am holy. I am distinct. I am uniquely different than everything else in creation. I am God. And so Peter comes to us and says, be holy like God is holy. In other words, be different like God is different. Be different. But friends, that's, that's, that's not enough. I mean, anybody can be different. Anybody can, anybody can be different. Look, the uh, person next to you is different. <laughs> Question is different how? Different how? Different, different from what? So the second aspect of this word is so critical uh, to understand because at the root of the word holy is the word whole. Whole, to be holy is to be holy or complete or perfect undefiled or indeficient, not deficient. In other words, uh, something that is undefiled from its original form or not deficient in its original purpose. You go back to the garden, Adam and Eve, they were holy. They were complete. They were not deficient. They were perfect. They were holy in both their identity and in their purpose. As we know, sin marred that wholeness and made them incomplete, made them inadequate, made them unholy. Friends, you and I were created for life. And sin has defiled and corrupted and stolen that life from us. And so as a follower of Jesus, friends, this is what it means to be a disciple. We are called to obedience. Obedience. Why? Because it is only in obedience that we can make our way back to wholeness. Wholeness. Obedience. We don't like that word any more than we like the word holy. But friends, you can't be whole without following Jesus into wholeness. We do ourselves a disservice when we think about obedience to Jesus as something negative or undesirable. That couldn't be further from the truth. We do ourselves a disservice when we think of our obedience as some way of of currying favor or earning points with God. That couldn't be further from the truth either. So friends, there's nothing you can do to get God to love you more, there's nothing you've done to get him to love you less. So what, what, what's the deal with this obedience? Jesus doesn't call us to obedience to win his approval. You already have it. What you don't have is wholeness, fullness of life, abundant life. Friends, every thou shalt and thou shalt not in the Bible is about God leading you into life. Every thou shalt and thou shalt not in the Bible is is not God trying to take something from you to oppress you, but to free you, to, to to, to bring you into life. Everything, everything Jesus says to you about everything in your life. Again, do money this way. Jesus says, just do money this way. Be grateful, be, be generous, be good and see how money will, get, will bring life to you, how it will bless you. If you just did money my way, if you just did relationships my way, if you would just turn the other cheek, if you would just speak the truth in love, if you would repent when you needed to and forgive when you needed to, and if you just honored each other and respected each other and served one another, you would find how life can be found in all of your relationships. Do do sex like this and see how sex can be a blessing to you. The sexual ethic in the Bible, talk about different, right? Who in the world agrees with you? 
Who in the world thinks that the biblical sexual ethic is the way to go? I mean, again, there's a lot of self-identified Christians who don't accept the biblical sexual ethic. (laughs) Friends, just look at the carnage around you. Just look at the world's way of doing sex. Look at the devastation wrought from a world that says to us, don't tell me what the Bible says about sex. That's weird. That's weird. Nobody ever thinks like that. Nobody lives like that. Do you think the world has figured this out? Go to Mardi Gras. You want weird? Peter says, be holy for I am holy. He's not telling us to be weird. He's telling us to find life. He's not telling us to be different for different sake. He's telling us to discover wholeness. Friends, different is not the point. Wholeness is the point. Life is the point. This was a key mark of the early church who operated in a completely pagan culture, who had nothing to do, who had no concept or understanding of the biblical ethic on anything. Again, you and I live in a Western culture that for hundreds of years have been influenced by the sexual eth- or the Christian ethic, which our secular friends in this moment are trying to destroy to their own destruction. But the first century had no such benefit. And it is well documented, friends. In the Roman culture, there was no social stigma in leaving a baby on the side of the road exposed to the elements left to die, especially if that baby was a girl. Nobody thought a thing about it. It was completely normal. If you didn't want the baby, just leave it outside and let it fend for itself. Friends, it was the church. It was followers of Jesus who picked up those babies and brought them home and saved their lives. It was followers of Jesus who raised the ethic of the dignity of life. In the first century, women and slaves were property for many uses among them, the sexual pleasure of their masters. Friends, it was the church. It was men. It was men who followed Jesus, who because of Jesus decided to honor the marriage bed and stop the exploitation of women and children. The first sexual revolution didn't happen in the 1960s, friends. It happened in the 60s. Roman culture didn't understand it. Why do you think like this? Why do you live like this? Jesus followers in the first century watched what they watched. They stopped going to the Colosseum where the destruction of human beings were on display for sport. The entire idea of human rights wouldn't exist without the church. Talk about different. It wasn't just different. It was weird. Nobody lived like this. Nobody thought like this. Where is this coming from? But friends, Jesus has given us life. He has called us into life. This is purpose. This is meaning. This is fulfillment. This is life. We obey Jesus. We we obey him. But why? For what purpose? Friends, for life for wholeness of life, not out of some moralistic, legalistic effort to earn his favor. You already have that. What we don't have is the wholeness of life. And so we just keep following. Verse 17, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each man's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Continue to obey him with fear throughout the time of your exile. This is interesting the way Peter puts it. You have a father who judges, a father who judges. Friends, you have to understand, no one will get out of this world without the creator of this world pronouncing judgment on this world. You will not escape it. But Jesus' follower, be assured, you have a judge who is your father. You have a son of the father who intercedes for you. Now, even as believers, sometimes we think of God only as one or the other. Ah, he's a good father and he kind of winks at what I do because you know what? I got grace. Or we think of him as a judge who punishes us and makes life hard for us and comes down hard when we fail. But friends, the key to understanding this dual relationship with God is this word fear, conducting ourselves with fear, the fear of the Lord. Again, this is a hard word to understand. Uh, And this this is interesting. Peter, Peter uses in his letter the term God, four times leading up to this passage. But now that he's talking about judgment, he switches terms to the father so that we could understand what's going on here. Since you call on him, not God as, 
and judge, but father and judge. Father and the father who judges. Catch the relational aspect of what Peter's talking about. You have a God who is not after begrudging submission from his subjects. You have a father who wants the fullness of life for his children. And so when he deals with you as judge to discipline you, to guide you, he does so as a father, the fear of the Lord. Think of it this way. It's one thing to offend a judge. It's another thing to offend a father. Have you ever offended your dad, your father who loves you? your father who's tried to grow you up, uh, a father who's tried to do the best things for you, the the father who's tried uh, to give you life. Uh, The New International Version adds the word reverent fear to this verse. Live your life as strangers, aliens, exiles. Here in reverent, in reverent fear. Friends, there's two ways to approach the judge. You can either approach him in, you can be terror struck or you can be awestruck. You can be afraid of him and what he might do to you. Or you can be in awe of him in what he has done for you. If you only know him as judge, dread is your only option. But if you know him as father, it changes the way you see his judgment. Why? Because Peter goes on, verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Again, there there are two ways of approaching God, only two, only two in the universe, human achievement or divine accomplishment. And you can take every religious faith system in the world and put it on the category of human achievement. Obey enough to get God to like you. Obey enough for the judge to acquit you. Obey enough to get you in. The only alternative, because that has proven to be inadequate and unproductive, it is not possible to obey enough to get God to like you. The only alternative to this is the, is the divine accomplishment, God doing for you in Jesus what you could not have done for yourself, the gift of grace. And the only appropriate response to that So what he has done is to surrender all that we do for him, an obedient will to discover life, an obedient will. Third mark of a living hope is a secure soul, a secure soul. You have been ransomed, redeemed, saved, rescued, purchased. Peter says, not with perishable things. He's already used that word in this letter. Verse four, you have an inheritance that is imperishable. Verse seven, you have a faith attested by fire will not perish. And then in verse 18, you have a redemption, a redemption infinitely more valuable than anything else in this world. Do you understand what it took to redeem your life, the price that was paid by the very God you offended, a gift that was given to you through no human achievement of your own, imperishable, It will never fade. It will never die. It will never lose its power or effect. Nothing and no one can take it from you, regardless of what you go through in this world. You are an elect exile. You belong to God. You don't belong here. And so no one can snatch you out of his hand. You have a living hope secured by the blood of Jesus. And then here's the last one, a compassionate heart. A compassionate heart. Having purified your soul by your obedience to the truth for sincere brotherly love, Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Peter uses the Greek word agape, which means the love of choice. It is the love of the will, choosing to love when you have every reason not to love. This, by the way, is the love of God, the God who chose to love us. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us. And so he's calling us to love like he loves. Be holy for I am holy. In other words, be different. Be different in the way you love. Be complete in the way you love. Love is the distinguishing mark of the church. And here's, here's the thing. And this, this is so important. We'll, we'll end with this, friends. These, these four marks that we've just seen, alert mind, obedient will, secure soul. Friends, that's about you. But this fourth one, a compassionate heart, loving one another earnestly from a pure heart. Friends, this is about us. This is about us. This is about you and me together. Peter is saying that you can't do this by yourself. This is a church thing. This is a corporate thing. This is a body thing. This is a family thing. This is a you and me thing. In other words, I can't, I cannot be, I can't do these first three things without this fourth thing. I can't be everything God has called me to be without loving you and you loving me from a pure heart. 
Now, most of you know that in American culture, the church is in trouble when it comes to participation and engagement. I don't think it's because we're worse lovers than the world because the world doesn't know how to love. Uh, I just think, in my humble opinion, I just think that we too often fail to show the world a different kind of love. And because we fail to to show a different kind of love to the world, we often give up on the mandate to love. We just kind of opt out. We just kind of walk away. Church attendance in America has been on the decline. It was on the decline long before the pandemic. It's dropping exponentially since the pandemic. We've just opted out. The only thing I want to say about that, friends, goodness, without the church, you and me together corporately, the body of Christ, without the church, there is no voice in the culture. You have to understand that. Without the church, there is no salt and light pushing back the darkness and the disintegration of the culture. Without the church, there is no influence. So friends, this is serious. This is serious. Your participation and your engagement in the corporate body of believers, the church. I've been at this for over 45 years. One of the things I hear way too often, I see all too frequently, is this, is People bailing on the church or walking away from the church, you know, because, you know, the church isn't all it should be. Uh, they, they fail to love. They don't fit. They, they fail to live up to what they should be. And so, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm just going to opt out. Me and Jesus are fine without all of you. Friends, that is not true. That is not biblical. That is not possible. Peter, right here in this letter, is telling us that we are biblically mandated to be in community with the brothers. Why? Because without the community, we have no voice in the culture. You have to be very careful on this one, friends. And I know, I know I'm speaking to the choir. But if you've not been there before, you may be there at some point because of your disappointment or disillusionment in what the church should be, thinking, you know what? I can be fine without the church. Friends, that is not possible. That is not possible. That is not biblical and that is not possible. You've got to be very careful on this, friends, that in your attempt to call out the self-righteous hypocrisy of the church, that you not fall into that same camp. I mean, I don't quite know how you could avoid it, actually. (laughs) To say that other Christians aren't living up to your standard is a pretty dangerous spot to stand in before the Jesus who died for your imperfections right? I mean, think about this. The disciples didn't bail on Jesus because of Judas. Because they weren't looking at Judas. They were looking at Jesus. They knew that they were, all of them were failures. They all knew that. And so they focused on Jesus, not on each other. Verse 13, they set their minds on the grace of God. Verse 18, they knew what it took to redeem them. Verse 22, and so they loved each other from a pure heart. Now get this, not a perfect heart, a pure heart. What is a pure heart, friend? A pure heart is just simply an honest heart. An honest heart, friends. Hypocrisy is not about perfection. It's, about, it's, a, it's just about honesty. Being honest with our failures and loving each other through our failures. I mean, listen, I, I want to be the first to acknowledge church hurt and church disappointment. I have been the victim of it. I have been the cause of it. And so we've all disappointed each other, Right? But without the church, friends, the church has had, has, it has always had its problems. It will always have its problems. Goodness, read your Bible. Go back to the first century, especially first Corinthians. Most of the New Testament that we have today is because of church problems. But we can't walk away from the church because the church has problems. Because we lose our voice and our culture. We lose our salt and light. Uh, to walk away from the church because believers can't get it together is a pretty self-righteous thing to do, don't you think? No, what we do is we extend the grace that we so desperately need from Jesus. We love each other the way Jesus has loved us. What we do is we keep our eyes on Jesus, not on the imperfections of others and how he has loved us. We love each other from a pure, not a perfect, but from from an honest heart who often fails, a heart that recognizes the need for grace, therefore willing to extend the grace that we so desperately need. Every person in this room, you look around this room, every, don't, don't look around this room, but every person you look at in this room is messed up. You know that, right? They are messed up. They are messed up. And a lot of you think you know how bad they're messed up. You don't know the half of it. <laughs> you can just know that they are messed up. What you don't know, friends, is what messed them up. What you don't know is where they've been, 
where they've come from. What you don't know is what God is doing in their heart right in this moment to redeem their souls and repurpose their life. What you can know is that God can redeem any story and repurpose any life beginning with yours. So this is Peter's mandate to us. Find your people, find your community of love, find those people that you can do life with in the grace of God. You don't have, now here's the deal, friends. This church is too large to do this anyway. You don't have to hang out with everybody. Not everybody in the church has to be your best friend. There are people in this church that you don't particularly care for. We know that. Be honest. You'd rather not hang out with them. Guess what? They're not that crazy about you. That's not the point. Friends, the ability to love God's people is not rooted in our likability. It is rooted in our shared story. We have all been saved by grace. Our lives are rooted in the forgiveness of Jesus. And it is imperative, it is mandated that we share the grace that we so desperately need. And so we're going to love each other We're going to respect and honor and serve one another. And we're going to find our people. There are people in this body of believers that you can do life with. Who's holding you accountable? Who's telling the truth to you, about you? Who loves you but is not impressed with you? Who's willing to challenge you and encourage you? And who are you doing this for? Who are you loving well? So that the world can see a different kind of love. Friends, this is hard. And this is why you can't do it on your own. This is a brutal world out to destroy your faith. How are you to live boldly in this brutal world? Friends, you stay alert. You take this seriously. You follow Jesus and you do what he says and you find your security in the gospel of Christ, the grace of Christ. And then you take this grace and you love each other well. You love each other well. Pray with me. Father, we are so grateful that you have saved us out of our imperfections and you loved us in spite of our imperfections. But Father, we repent. We repent of the times that we've used the imperfections of others to rationalize or justify our unwillingness to love. Father, we live in a dark world in which you have placed us to be salt and light. And we pray, Father, that by the power of your spirit, you would embolden us and equip us with alert minds, obedient wills, secure souls in the grace of God, and hearts that love well. To that end, we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.